After World War II, international diplomacy was marked by conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. For nearly 50 years, relations between the two were dominated by political discord, military tension, and economic competition. Much of the world became divided between the allies of the United States and NATO and the allies of the Soviet Union and its Eastern Bloc. In 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev became the leader of the Soviet Union. His reforms of Perestroika and Glasnost ushered in the end of communism and the eventual collapse of the USSR in 1991. Twenty years later, many questions remain. What caused the fall of the Soviet Union? Was it a yearning for freedom or the victim of an economic and systemic collapse? How did the world respond? And what are the implications for today? This year, we mark the 20th anniversary of those historic events with a discussion at the Knight Studio at the Museum in Washington, D.C. It is in partnership with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Joining me is a distinguished group with extensive experience on the Soviet Union and Russia during their time in office. Brent Scowcroft served as the National Security Advisor under President Gerald Ford and George H.W. Bush. Zbigniew Brzezinski was the National Security Advisor for President Jimmy Carter. Stephen Hadley was the National Security Advisor for President George W. Bush. Lawrence Summers was Treasury Secretary under President Bill Clinton and a Principal Economic Advisor for President Barack Obama. Here is a conversation at the museum about the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Soviet Union. And I begin with the question that I raised uh, in this introduction. What, in fact, caused the collapse of the Soviet Union? Was it a yearning on the part of their people, or was it somehow an economic and systemic collapse of a system that could not go on? If in place of Gorbachev, who came in in 1985, with a sort of a mandate to get things going again, because you had had a series of either senile or sick three mm -hmm. heads of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, General Secretary of the Communist General Party. General Secretary of the Communist Party. Uh, and Gorbachev had a mission. And he but was if, young and vibrant and different. That's right. But in, if instead of Gorbachev, there had been another uh, Brezhnev, for example, I think things might have been very different. I think Gorbachev, he was not a Democrat, uh, but he was trying to revify the Soviet Union as a competitor. And so he did things to change. He did, uh, you know, uh, an assault on absenteeism, drunkenness, corruption, and so on. And he changed some of the rules, some of the punitive rule, arbitrary rules, that were so negative for the Soviet people to try to get production up, to try to improve productivity. And in, that, in doing that, he undermined the system. We know that there were different ideas about the strength of the Soviet Union within our own government and within the CIA. Were we surprised by what happened when Gorbachev came to power and decided what he was prepared to do? Uh, I think we were. I think we were surprised, in part, because we had been used to. Uh, well, we, we, had, we had Brezhnev. Uh, then uh, can't remember his name. The following Andropov. 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 And then Chernyenko. Uh, and, and then Chernyenko. And so uh, Gorbachev was kind of a breath of fresh air, somebody we could deal with. Uh, and matter of fact, Mar Margaret Thatcher, after her first meeting, said, here's a, here's man, a man I can, can deal with. Here's a man I can deal with. So we sort of took him at face value, in a sense. But in the, in the Bush administration, when we came into power, there had been a lot of talk, well, the Cold War is over, and so on. And Gorbachev's rhetoric was very different. But we didn't think the Cold War was over, because the Cold War was a division of Eastern Europe. And nothing, in fact, had changed on the ground. Mm -hmm. Why so, was the collapse peaceful, Zbigniew? I think it was peaceful, in part because it was so comprehensive. You know, your basic question asked, was it because of freedom, or was it because of economic conditions, and, of course, was it because of Gorbachev? Of course, it was all three, but they weren't all the same. For example, the quest for freedom really wasn't within the Soviet Union or democracy. It was in the Soviet bloc. Right. And that undermined the external part of the Soviet system and created a real crisis. The crisis got worse because economically the Soviet Union was in a mess and couldn't respond 
to the challenge that it was facing within the Soviet bloc. It couldn't give freedom to the bloc and couldn't bribe it, so mm. to speak, with economic assistance. So that made things much worse. And then Gorbachev was beating his head against an existing system, experimenting a lot, doing wonderful things in some respects in re as we look at it, but in other ways doing odd things, like, for example, trying to prevent the Russians from drinking alcohol which created enormous disruption, both yes. economically and in terms of social behavior. And it demoralized the party, while the example of the Soviet bloc disintegrating for national reasons, then began to infect the non-Russian peoples within the Soviet Union. And then they began to demand more and more autonomy. And that started rising to a crescendo, initially just to decentralize the Soviet Union, and then eventually, all of a sudden, to dismantle it. So we had a very dynamic and complicated process here that unfolded before our eyes. Gorbachev also believed that you could reform communism. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, which is I, what I, Yeltsin did yeah. not prepare to believe. Yeah. Charlie, I, I, Charlie, I believe that there are many uh, parts of this, obviously, but a pervasive loss of legitimacy associated with pervasive incompetence in doing the minimal things that a government has to do allowing people's standards of living to go anywhere. It's almost without precedent in modern societies in peacetime that life expectancy declined significantly, as it was in the Soviet Union before 1989. Chernobyl was the tip of an iceberg of growing numbers of accidents caused by lack of uh, supervision. The world was opening up and people could see more outside and trying to keep things closed and hierarchical was becoming more and more dysfunctional. And the saving grace of the Russian economy, the possession of significant uh, quantities of oil, became worth much less as the price of oil plummeted. So there was a profound loss of legitimacy of the existing order which affected what happened inside Russia, which affected what happened inside the other republics of the former Soviet Union. Gorbachev was a response to that. He tried one set of strategies. The truth is there probably was no strategy that pres preserved hierarchical communism and allowed that to continue. So what was Gorbachev's legacy then? Larry? His legacy was an unintended and unsought uh, legacy. It was the peaceful dissolution of the empire he inherited, the economic system he had vowed uh, to energize, and the political system for which he held trust as uh, the new uh, leader. And it was that all of that uh, fell away. But recognizing what trends were in motion, he allowed it to uh, fall away without doing what probably was within his power, uh, summoning, force, summoning forth uh, tremendous violent forces. As they sometimes say about leaders, they have their priorities wrong. Some will argue that if Gorbachev had taken the Chinese course, not so much political freedom and just for focused on the economy, uh, he may have been more successful. Stephen? I think a lot of people say that. He tried to do the two. He thought they were related. They are related. And he thought you needed to lead with the uh, political reform, the Glosnost, to, uh, in some sense, shake up. Uh, the the uh, Soviet system. But I think we have to recognize in some sense it's an unwitting legacy. As Brent said, he really thought that uh, he could transform the system under the communist ideology. That turned out to be wrong. Second of all, of course, it starts in eastern Germany, and he decides and sends the message that Russian tanks are not going to bail out East Germany. And once it's clear that people, that the fear is gone, people vote with their feet and the wall comes down. It's a critical decision. And I think, in some sense, Yeltsin gets some support in this way. For whatever reason, Yeltsin felt Russia needed to uh, 
in some completely. sense, shake right. off uh, the Soviet empire. And he thought uh, that Russia, in order to, for Russia to emerge, in some sense, he had to kill the Soviet Union. In order to kill the Soviet Union, he had to kill communism. So there is a role that he plays in all this uh, as well. Just one minor correction, though. This is the, the disintegration of the Soviet bloc ended in East Germany, but it actually started east of that is fair. East Germany, right. in Poland, in the Baltic Republics, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Gorbachev's decision not to intervene the way Brezhnev intervened in Czechoslovakia in 68 opened the floodgates. And by the time East Germany erupted, the situation was totally out of control, and it was beginning to affect the Ukrainians, the Bolts, the Belarusians, the Georgians, and others. Yeltsin is extremely important in the end of the <coughs> Soviet Union because they, they started out as allies and buddies, right. and they got estranged, and eventually Yeltsin hated Gorbachev. And when he came back from Yalta after the coup, uh, Yeltsin publicly humiliated him. Yes. And I think the Soviet Union ended when it did because Yeltsin pulled it right out from under Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. Gorbachev had, if there was no Soviet Union, he had no job. So I think the tactics of it were strongly influenced by the relationship between those two. Now, there was a historic moment. I think, Brent, you're absolutely right. It was actually on Soviet television and therefore on world television. Gorbachev comes back to Moscow, released from that very brief internment. Right. In the meantime, Yeltsin is triumphant. He resisted. He prevailed. He greets him. They have a joint meeting, press conference, and so forth. And in the course of it, Yeltsin says something to the fact that this is the end of the Communist Party. And Gorbachev protests, says, no, no, it isn't. We have to democratize. And Yeltsin says, no, it's the end, pulls out a piece of paper, signs it, and says, I have now signed a decree disbanding the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Okay, so let's talk about how the United States was reacting while this was happening. What decisions were we making about a, a being supportive, about uh, communicating a sense that, that we were pleased by this and we were prepared not to take advantage of it? Well, let me say what the policy of the Bush administration was when it came into office. There was ferment in Eastern Europe, uh, and there had been it, in cases in the past, Berlin, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, each time the Soviet Union had come in, crushed it, killed the demonstrators, and uh, we were worried that that could be repeated. So what we wanted to do is encourage Eastern European independence and development, but at, at a pace that was under the Soviet radar, either that they would react or that they would overthrow Gorbachev in a coup. Mm -hmm. uh, we, now, we didn't know what that pace was, but that was our strategic goal. Now, there was a coup, but it was in 1991, and it was too late and too inept, really, to, uh, to make a difference. We began to develop uh, two things that are important policy points. I want to talk first about the economic, what has been called shock therapy. Was that a mistake? Larry? I think the people who have gone back and have studied the different parts of the former Soviet Union and Central Europe have fairly consistently found that those who did more reform more quickly are in a stronger position economically today than those who did less reform and uh, did it more slowly. So in the fullness of it, those who moved uh, to the market were rewarded uh, for it. You look at the Baltic uh, countries, you look at the Czech, Re you look at the Czech Republic and, uh, and Poland. We supported through the, primarily through the international financial institutions and secondarily with our own funds, we supported uh, the process of uh, reform. That support came with uh, conditions. We, for example, insisted that if we were going to put money in, there be a policy framework that made it likely that that money would stay in the country rather than come outside uh, the country. We provided support for stabilization, but conditioned it on pursuing policies that would prevent, uh, that would pre that would prevent hyperinflation. 
Were those policies broadly correct? I think they were. With the benefit of hindsight, uh, can you find errors in the policies that were pursued that one would wish the IMF had intervened in some way to stop? Uh, absolutely, uh, one can. But would an idea of simply providing funds without any encouragement to policy reform have been a better strategy? I very seriously uh, doubt uh, that it would have been a better strategy. Were there successes in Central Europe or the former Soviet Union of a highly gradualist uh, strategy? I don't think so. I know that many people make an argument that there was some alternative Chinese model that, if pursued, would have been uh, availing. I think that's a misreading of the economic difference between the challenges China faced and the vastly greater challenges that, uh, that Russia and the other Soviet republics faced. China was primarily an agricultural country. They had hundreds of millions of people farming. What they received had nothing that was correlated with what they produced. If you simply had the idea that instead of everybody picks rice and everybody gets the same amount, that how much rice you get has something to do with how much rice you pick, you could start an economic miracle underway, and China did. Russia wasn't primarily an agricultural country. That kind of thing was not available to it. So what was the attitude then uh, of the Russia about the United States? Did they feel, that the Russian leadership feel <coughs> the United States uh, was, could have done more? I think they thought we could do more, right. yes. Uh, at the time, we were going through a budget problem, though. And I remember uh, the orders that uh, if you wanted to spend some money that wasn't in the budget, you had to find some somewhere else in the budget mm -hmm. to spend it. When the workers go to the streets and so on, we wanted to provide some assistance. Mm -hmm. It was embarrassingly tiny. And so when uh, Gorbachev comes to us and asks for help, we tell him to go to West Germany, uh, in addition to the IMF. Mm -hmm. So right. we did not, we did not help much economically. Okay, lay on top of this NATO expansion. It's a big... Um, was it, did it send a message to the Russians that uh, we were trying to encircle them? The fact of the matter is that the collapse of Soviet power in Central Europe created a vacuum, a vacuum which was being filled by democratic aspirations, <laughs> but also a great deal of uncertainty. I think the West and the United States responded correctly over time because it took almost a decade to enlarge NATO, which every one of the countries that entered NATO desperately wanted to do. So it was in keeping with their aspirations. What I think we did not do sufficiently was to use that same period of time to engage the Russians in a more wide-ranging discussion of security arrangements, security arrangements between us and the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, Russia under the new circumstances, but also some of the other post-Soviet, non-Russian states. I, I wrote a little bit about this. You wrote a book that basically said that this was a time in which the United States missed a huge opportunity. Yes, because I think we could have engaged the Russians in security discussions that might have created a kind of a structure, a loose structure of mutual reassurance. So how did Putin come to power? Well, Putin came to power because of the internal failure in the Soviet Union of the Yeltsin regime. In, in Russia, of the, of the Yeltsin I'm regime. I'm sorry, right. that's a bad habit of mine. I've been living with the Soviet <laughs> Union for such a long time that it's hard not to think of that the area yeah. as the Soviet Union. So of the course, failure Russia. of Yeltsin let open the way for his own... He well, it was a tragic... He handpicked... It was a himself. tragic failure because Yeltsin was a complicated individual who was at one point a really true and simplistic believer in the doctrine, who then became completely disillusioned with it, who then rediscovered a new sense of identity, namely Russia, rather than the Soviet Union. And he started responding to the very natural aspirations of the Russians to express their identity politically, economically, and to seek again some major role in the world scene. 
And he found it very difficult to do that in the midst of an economic crisis. Incertitude, demoralization, corruption, competition, and last but not least, his own affliction with alcohol, mm. which was a serious, serious problem, which sometimes we didn't note too much deliberately because we didn't want to offend him or embarrass him. But, but this was a man it, it who was really in his last widely. days was an alcoholic. It was reported widely. Yeah. Where has Putin taken Russia? Uh, and and what do, how do we look at Russia today? Well, I would hazard the judgment that he also has missed an opportunity. He wanted, and understandably so, to reestablish a sense of pride and of status. And that's normal, uh, acceptable, and certainly would be a good thing for Russia, but also for the world that was done in a larger framework. Uh, but he saw it increasingly as something that was to be a corrective to the recent past. He famously said that the greatest calamity of the 20th century was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Now, can you imagine what he's really saying? A greater calamity than World War I, which killed millions of people, a greater calamity than World War II, which killed scores of millions of people, plus the Holocaust, in the Yezhovshina and the killings within Russia. Take 1937, one very good example, because there's documentation on it. In 1937, on an individual basis, 770,000 Russians were executed and non-Russians within the Soviet Union. It's a staggering statistic. You know, this is the kind of century we lived through, and yet he nostalgically talks about not only that being the greatest, worst calamity of the 20th century, but he tries to recreate a common economic space, a commonwealth under Moscow's uh, control, which really is nostalgia. One of the splits between him and Medvedev was that Medvedev almost explicitly was rejecting that nostalgia, and yet Putin has identified himself with it. And I think he therefore has diverted Russia from a course which might have been open, namely progressive modernization, increasing democratization, greater ties with the West, and so forth. Is there more freedom today, individual freedom, in China or in Russia? In Russia. Look, Russia. Russia. Russia is a traditional autocracy. It's not a totalitarian state. Um, the press is relatively open. You know, if you go to Russia and read newspapers in Russia these days, they really give you diversity of views and a lot of real news from the outside world. Secondly, television is really an imitative instrument of Western mass media and tries to compete and appeal to the public the same way. Beyond that, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Russians travel abroad regularly and tens of thousands study abroad. And then they go back. Some, of course, don't go back. All of that creates a degree of openness to the world, which Russia has never before experienced. And this is why I personally think the Putin episode is a transitional pe episode. It's not going to lead to some restoration of totalitarianism or some permanent autocracy. It's going to fade. The question is, will it fade gradually, peacefully, or will there be some new upheaval in Russia? Maybe not immediately, but within a decade or so, if things continue to deteriorate. Brent, you were going to say? I think there's another element in the Putin thing, which is important because Putin is mm. going to be the next president again. And that is, he embodies the sense of humiliation at the end of the Cold War. Uh, President Bush Sr. at the end of the Cold War says, nobody lost the Cold War. We all won because it's over. And we made a, a real effort for time. Then I think we tended to forget how it probably looked inside the former Soviet Union. And we went ahead mm -hmm. and we expanded NATO to include some of the so former Soviet republics. We did away with the ABM Treaty. We said, and Putin himself, I heard him say at the Munich Security Conference, when we were weak and flat on our backs, you, walk, you took advantage of us, you walked all over us. And he cited NATO and so on and so forth. Medvedev doesn't have those kind of hang-ups. And I think Putin did it partly for nationalism and partly it was sincere.
and I think he's gradually getting over it. A, a moment of history. Um, when the Berlin Wall came down, mm -hmm. what was President Bush's response? His response was very calm and very quiet. First of all, we weren't sure what was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he called a press conference in his office to announce that the Berlin part of it was, had opened up. And uh, one of the reporters said, Mr. President, you don't seem very elated. I would think you'd want to go and dance on the wall. And he said, well, I'm not that kind of a person. But what he was trying to do is not to shove it in Gorbachev's face mm. as a victory for the West. Uh, because what we were worried about is a coup against Gorbachev or something mm. like that. Uh, and Gorbachev's attitude changed dramatically with the fall of the wall. He had, been, he had been a supporter of our policy in Eastern Europe before because mm. he wanted these little Gorbachevs right. in Eastern Europe. He changed dramatically after the wall fell because he was apprehensive. You served in the Clinton administration. What was the President Clinton's attitude about what to do about Russia? His urge first was, as Brent uh, said, uh, to avoid humiliation. Uh, in Russia was to encourage the repair of what had artificially taken place at the end of the Second uh, World War in terms of the division of Europe uh, to support the spread of democracy and market forces as uh, widely as uh, possible. And that's why he sought to mobilize the international financial institutions on a large scale, why he was engaged in extensive uh, summetry with uh, President Yeltsin, why he uh, <coughs> presided over and led an effort to uh, have the G7 uh, become in substantial part a uh, G8, G8 uh, to recognize uh, Russia's uh, importance. But it was a very difficult balance to strike. Uh, on the one hand, the uh, respect rather than humiliation was an important lesson of uh, history. On the other hand, he was no longer prepared to have much of what the United States did be defined by what it saw and projected onto uh, what was happening uh, in Russia. And so he sought an aggressive uh, policy of personal uh, engagement uh, with President Yeltsin, was very involved and stepped up the efforts at uh, economic uh, reform but at the same time was very mindful of a whole set of uh, security issues, in particular the need to denuclearize um, and control so-called uh, loose nukes uh, in, uh, in, in Russia. Because there always was expressed this concern that somehow, because they weren't able to pay the military, you know, that, that somehow the, the uh, nuclear weapons might, might not be safe. You know, there's a kind of broad lesson in, in history, and uh, these gentlemen could, could speak to it probably better, uh, better than I, which is that overly strong states are profound threats to their own citizens and to others, but that vacuums mm. are as well. And so on the one hand, one wanted to dismantle this totalitarian apparatus that had meant so much that was wrong. Uh, in the world for 70 years. On the other hand, one did have to maintain uh, an awareness of the, as I say, the historical danger of vacuums. The operative word with respect to Russia when President Obama came to power was reset. Was it necessary to reset the relationship and from what to what? And Stephen can respond to that as well. Oh, I think it was a kind of a fashionable word uh, which, after all, is part of the age of the Internet. 
and computers and so forth. But if you ask yourself seriously, what does it really refer to? It refers to some pieces of the relationship. That is to say, see if we can stabilize the security relationship through a treaty that moves us to lower levels of mutual reciprocal threat. And can we address some of the regional issues that are point of contention, but not necessarily of conflict? Well, first of all, the legacy of the Russian-Georgian military right. uh, clash. But beyond that, the question, for example, of the aspirations of the Ukrainians to be part of the EU in some fashion, not as members, right. but as associated, right. instead of being dragged into the common economic space in which they would run the risk of losing their independence. But let's talk about why we needed to talk about reset. Uh, what we saw over the last half of uh, President Putin's term is the more the price of oil went up, the more he made some good macroeconomic decisions, the more the economy recovered. Uh, and in some sense, the more respect he got from the Europeans, the less inclined he was to make the kind of fundamental political reforms we thought he needed to do to institutionalize a democratic future for the country. And in some sense, it reached its apotheosis, if you will, in this Russian invasion of Georgia. And at the time, there was a lot of uncertainty about how to read that. Was it a one-off effort to knock down uh, President uh, Charlie Kashvili, uh, or was this the first of a sort of a return to a 19th century diplomacy, today Georgia, tomorrow the Ukraine, and maybe the Baltics later? And in order to make the point uh, that this could not be the future of Russian diplomacy in Europe, we basically uh, threw most of the relationship in the sink. Uh, we were able tactically to prevent uh, the Russians from overturning Saakashvili and working with Europeans, the international system, if you will, imposed a lot of penalties on uh, Russia for this activity. And we were to make the point that this could not happen again. So when we left office and the Obama administration came into office, sure, by design, in response to the, what Russia had done in Georgia, we had driven the relationship to a very low point. Whoever was elected uh, in November of uh, 2008 was going to have to start r restoring that uh, relationship with Russia. And that's, in some sense, the context of reset. I think one of the major issues of contention is also the question of the so-called missile shield uh, that the United States desires to have in Central Europe and now also in Turkey. The idea is that it is to defend against Iran. Exactly. Now, the Russians have a very different view of this. Uh, whether it's sincere or whether it's tactical, that can be debated, but it certainly is a source of contention. Okay, so what's the relation? Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think uh, uh, Paul's big and Steve are, are right, but to me, the reset is almost wholly psychological, and it worked. It was, let, made let's them just feel change like, the atmosphere. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. All of these things yeah, have come factor. up. Let's yeah. just change the atmosphere. And they were suspicious at first, but it was the right thing to do. So how do we measure whatever cooperation there might be with respect to Russia having to do with Iran, especially, and other places where they could play a constructive role? I Anybody? think uh, I think there are a number of areas where we can cooperate. Iran is one. And are they prepared to do it, is my question. Uh, they have been increasingly cooperative. Right on Iran. They're increasingly cooperative on Afghanistan. They have a real stake in Afghanistan because a lot of the drugs come from Afghanistan and go uh, through Russia. So uh, I think there are a lot of substantive areas where we can, in fact, uh, cooperate more. I, I agree with that. I think one of the, the things that is not appreciated, as at least during George W. Bush's administration, how cooperative Russia was on Iran, holding up, dragging their feet on Bushir, really conducting some very intense diplomacy to try to get the Iranians to agree to freeze their enrichment program and to come back to an agreement that uh, was negotiated between Iran and the Europeans in 2005. I think they get a bad reputation in some sense because they seem so reluctant to go on, go along with the UN Security Council resolutions. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and I think that's true, and they could be have been more cooperative there. But I think in a lot of behind-the-scenes way, uh, they were very cooperative on Iran. They put real pressure on Iran, and they were pretty good partners uh, on Iran. I think, though, the problem is, in the end of the day, the Russians don't believe our strategy is going to work. With respect to Iran. With respect to Iran. They and believe they don't that we can't stop them from having a nuclear weapon if they are committed They believe to that our current strategy of sanctions and, the, and pressure will not work, and they don't want to walk down the road of a failed policy and be stuck with uh, a, a destroyed relationship with Iran, because Iran is, of course, a lot closer to them than it is to us. I, I think they're wrong about that, but I think the bottom line is they don't see our strategy as succeeding, and Russians will tell you, but they don't have an alternative strategy that will. But, but, in, go to but in fairness, I think one has to say, that the Russians aren't isolated in that point of view. Right. <laughs> that is to say, quite a few other countries in the world have real doubts yeah. about our policy towards Iran. China, in some respects India, in some respects Turkey, in some respects Brazil, and so forth. Yeah. But is there, so, common you know, there's a real problem is here. there a common denominator among those countries in which they are saying the U.S. is on the wrong course, but this is the right course, we all agree? No, Anything divided. other than negotiations? They're divided. They're right. divided. But they also do think that on some issues, in the policy of sanctions is too rigid, and our willingness to compromise on some issues is not exactly overwhelming. You agree with that, don't you? I tend to be critical of our policy towards Iran. I think we are unintentionally creating a fusion between kind of primitive Iranian theocracy and Iranian nationalism, which is embraced by the much more advanced and democratically oriented portions of Iranian society, which are nonetheless very resentful uh, Larry, of the fact that we're treating Iran as a kind of to be ostracized enemy. Larry, you sat in the White House. Uh, and the principal focus was on the economy, the U.S. domestic economy and the global economy. Where does Russia come in in all that? The commercial significance of uh, Russia has never been that great for the United States, principally because the Russian economy just isn't that large mm. and rich, and secondarily because, like geographically big countries, the Russian economy uh, is not that open. So the reason why economic issues with respect to Russia have been so important is because of uh, their uh, political, uh, sig political significance. You know, look, I've been involved uh, over the years in discussions of WTO uh, accession uh, for any number of countries. Um, and I participate in those discussions in two administrations. And there's no other country where the WTO accession, where the level of interest of the National Security Council relative to the level of interest of the Department of Commerce was what it is with respect to Russia. Usually the Department of Commerce is profoundly interested in the national security, has a lot of things to worry about. Because the National Security Council is very concerned with issues of knitting Russia into the global system, they care profoundly because the, National, because the Department of Commerce is concerned with quantities of uh, commerce. Uh, their interest uh, is uh, secondary. All right. Russia's weight as an economic power over the next decade will be largely dependent on what happens to uh, the price of oil. $150 oil, you're going to see a lot of stuff in Russia. $60 oil, you're not going to see an economic event that's important in a commercial sense. Let me close this with a, with a broader sort of big issue. This is a country of great land mass. This is a country of huge, wonderful, extraordinary culture. Uh, this is a country of lots of nuclear weapons. Uh, and this is a country uh, that's been, uh, had its deep economic issues. And finally, this is a country, unlike rising powers, faces a declining population and demographics. I think we're looking at a country that's going through a transition, a historic transition. 
Russia back to the days of Peter the Great had a debate about whether they were really an Asian right. culture or a European culture that didn't share in the Renaissance and the Reformation. They're still basically there. And I think they're now searching for their soul. They've had three, four presidents since the end of the Cold War. There will be more. And I think we ought to behave in a way which encourages them to conclude they're a part of Europe and a productive part of Europe. But it's going to take a long time. And they're not going to, do, they're not going to go the way they go because of what we tell them, but the atmosphere mm -hmm. that hopefully we can create that will attract them. It's uh, one of the puzzles about Russia, which is a country that is a genius for music, for literature, for science, and has such trouble with politics. And I, I don't think we know where Russia goes, but I think we won't really know until the current generation leaves the scene and the next generation starts to come forward. Uh, there are people who make arguments of a bottom-up uh, elements that will encourage democracy in the future. We have to see it'll be in the hands of the next generation, and, and I think we really won't know till they begin to emerge on, on the scene. I think we'll get some clues from two very important developments, one in the shorter run, one in the longer run. If Ukraine continues to succeed in maintaining its independence, in preserving some significant degree of democracy within, although that is being tested right now, if it remains friendly to Russia, I emphasize that, but at the same time, considering everything I have said, moves towards the West, which it wishes to do through closer ties with the European Union, that will have a very significant impact on the way the Russians evolve and look at their own future, because it will tell the Russians two things. One, you cannot be an empire again, but two, there's an alternative path which is productive, which is to go the same way as Ukraine. And that, in turn, is dependent on the second thing, which would be a clue to us, namely, will there be, in the foreseeable future, some genuine turn again towards the democratization, legalization, constitutionalization of the Russian political system? Because without that, it's very difficult to envisage the process of moving towards the West being sustained. The and these things we can observe, hmm. we can measure, and in some degree, we can encourage, one, by being open to the Ukrainians, two, by not in any way viewing them as turning against Russia, but rather viewing them as anticipating Russia's future, and to the extent that we can, by contacts, education, and so forth, but without too many illusions, try to support the democratic forces in Russia, which ultimately have to be indigenous. They have to be their own. They cannot be a products of our making. Charlie, I, I agree with essentially everything that's everything that's been said but I would put it in a slightly different uh, way um, until 20 years ago Russia was the most extraordinary of adversaries it in important respects the United States as a country its policy its society was defined by the Cold War and the Soviet Union was our adversary. Today, Russia is a far more ordinary country. It is no longer the society by which, against which, we define ourselves. It is probably at this moment not one of the three to five societies that is the largest source of potential national security problems for uh, the United for the United States. Its internal developments are of no greater concern to the lives of ordinary Americans than internal developments in a significant number of uh, other uh, countries. It will 
face challenges and fluctuations and move in ways that are better for it and ways that are more constructive in terms of our relationship. There will be waves that will move in the other direction, but it is much more in the nature of the kind of relations that the United States has with a group of major nations of which Russia uh, remains uh, one and will uh, be one than it is uh, the North Star of uh, American strategy and American policy. And that is, I think, the largest change from the world of uh, 20 years ago. That doesn't mean these kinds of deliberations are no longer important. Of course they are. But they no longer have uh, the kind of uh, transcendence important that they had for much of the post-Second World War period. And I was just thinking, as you said that, in looking down this list, this lineup of people who've had enormous influence, uh, a lot has changed since uh, your colleague Henry Kissinger went to China and then the big or led to the recognition of China. The initial motivation was to find, in part, leverage against Russia. Oh, absolutely. It was. Uh, it was to split the two and to make common cause with the Chinese. Although, I must say, at the same time, uh, we started the policy of detente. Yes. To sort of balance things off. But yes, that, that, was, uh, that was the really first attempt to change mm -hmm. things. If you look at uh, an elementary economics textbook from 1960, it talks about trends in the world economy. And it suggests that it is quite likely, not certain, but really quite a substantial chance that Russian standards of living will exceed American standards of living by 1985. John Kennedy thought it was quite likely that Russia would surpass the United States as an economic uh, power. So it's a profound change. And I would say that the magnitude of that change and the magnitude of the misperceptions we had should, above all, caution us that as we look at the world uh, today, we should look at it with very much an awareness that an enormous range of outcomes and evolutions are uh, possibilities, and that those which seem most likely today may seem quite absurd a generation from now. Let me jump in here. I mean, I was in the government in the 1970s, and I've been deeply involved in this issue. I don't know about John Kennedy and his predictions for Russia, but I can't recall too many people in the American government in the 1970s who thought that Russia would surpass, surpass America in economic power and the standard of living in the 1980s. The Russians were claiming they would do that. That was Khrushchev's plank. Mm -hmm. What worried us the most was that they would gain military superiority. Yeah, that was the real worry. Because I think underneath that, there was a great deal of awareness of the fact that the economy wasn't what the Russians were proclaiming it was, that it was running down into the ground, that it was stalemated, and that these were sort of estimates that were devoid of much rationality. In fact, by the late 1970s, Within the Russian elite, there was a pervasive understanding of the fact that Russia was not moving beyond the industrial age, was not entering the age of the internet and the computer, that it was stalemated and stagnating. And that was the underpinning for the crisis that emerged. Notwithstanding their space exploration. Space explorations were wonderful, but remember, they lost the, they lost the race to the moon, and they didn't accomplish much after that. They spent a lot of resources competing with us, and they realized this wasn't working. So they still had left the nuclear weapons, which they were really competitive, and the illusion proclaimed by Khrushchev and propagated rather inanely by Brezhnev that they would surpass us in economic power, whereas in fact they were measuring that race by steel and by coal and things of that sort and timber, but not by all of the new dimensions big, I think by if, which economics... Big, I think if you go back, I think what you're saying is right, and I would stand by what, what I said, and I would note that the late 1950s and early 1960s to the late 1970s was quite a long time. And 
quite a lot became clear over that uh, 15 to 20 year period that was not clear at the beginning of that uh, period. And it had a great deal to do, as you suggest, yeah. with the measure of economic yeah, success actually, having le what, less and less to do with how many what, tons of steel you're you produced. What you're talking about is really the early 60s, because that was the era of the Sputnik. The sudden emergence, it seemed, of the Soviet Union as an innovative technological power, and that gave a burst to this kind of historical pessimism. But believe me, by the 70s and 80s, I agree with that. there are very few serious yeah. people who believe that. I agree with that. Well, and the interesting you know. thing, too, is that Ronald Reagan in Reykjavik, you know, dealt with um, Gorbachev. And Gorbachev uh, was frightened about um, a space initiative, that there was some shield that was possible, because it is said he believed that the Soviet Union did, could not keep up. That's absolutely right. I think, though, we have to r remind ourselves there was certainly the economic dimensions, there was the national security dimensions. Uh, there was also the ideological dimensions. This was, you know, communism, which had a... Many of us feared in the 60s, 70s, and 80s that, and, and some people thought this was actually the wave of the future and the United States was going to, to go into decline. And of course, what was the casualty of the events we celebrate seven, 20 years ago was not only the freeing of Eastern Europe and the end of the Soviet Union, but it was the death of communism and the end of communism as an ideology. And I remember at one point, President Putin was in the Oval Office with President George W. Bush, and we were talking about the end of that period, and um, President Putin says, remember, there were a whole generation of Russians who were willing to die for communism, and I was one of those. That tells you how far we've come. Putin said that? He did. But he didn't fight in the war, so I don't know how he was planning <laughs> to die. <laughs> Thank you very much. Brent, thank you very thank much, you. Steve. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Larry. Thank you for joining us for this remarkable conversation. 20 years after the fall and collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, who were the personalities that shaped it? Uh, what was the U.S. role in terms of responding to it and the Western world? And where is Russia today? And how, what role can it play in the world? All questions that we've addressed here. And we thank you for joining us.